Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of talks. And this is going to be several talks on the aorta and its branches. And I'll be looking at acute processes. There are many different pathologies we can think about when you think of the aorta and its branch vessels. And if I wanted to cover everything, I'm probably going to have to do about two days worth of talks. And I want to do this in two or three talks. So I have about 180 slides, if that means anything to you. So let's get started. Now, the reason CTA is so valuable in looking at the abdomen is because, and I will be focusing on the abdomen in this talk, and we'll do another talk on vascular disease acute in the chest at a later date, but scan protocols are reproducible and less dependent on the scanner and scan operator. You can get a good study most of the time, unlike MR, which it can be very difficult. Scan times are typically measured in seconds and patient cooperation is minimized, which is especially important in sicker patients. Imaging of the vessels as well as the bowel and major organs are accomplished in a single examination. We have high spatial resolution for looking at small vessels and small aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms, for example. As I'll show you, post-processing is critical in these cases. The ability to routinely detect pathology beyond the area of interest is also important, and particularly with vascular disease or vasculitis, there is often multiple organ involvement. One of the nice things with CTA is you're not really thinking about, oh, what's good for the kidney alone or good for the mesenteric vessels alone. If you time things correctly, you'll get all the vessels, even the ones you're not suspecting that could be problematic. And finally, it's availability 24-7, 365 in the ER, for example. Now, when we look at processes like Crohn's disease, we talk about Crohn's with a comb sign, fatty proliferation, but you can see those really fine vessels measuring well under a millimeter going to the terminal ileum. The prominent enhancement of the ileum seen very nicely on the MIP imaging. The changes with the prominent comb sign seen very nicely on the cinematic images. And this typically is associated with active Crohn's disease. We can look at this next case where there's a dissection in the patient's SMA, in this patient with acute abdomen due to vasculitis, or this patient with very prominent vas erecta, and a patient who also had Crohn's disease, or this patient who had an acute abdomen, and you can see there's the SMA and there's the thrombus. There's the SMA and there's the occlusion. And you can see the occlusion is not the entire vessel, but a short segment of the vessel, which you can see on the MIP imaging, but you can see how nicely CT angiography is good at looking the entire vessel. So even when there are small areas of occlusion or stenosis or involvement, we'd be very good at seeing it. Or things like this patient with back pain and obstructed right renal pelvis, which is due to a, a crossing renal artery, an accessory vessel that obstructs the renal pelvis, or sticking with the renal arteries in this case, in this patient with a splenic artery aneurysm, which is calcified, but a very large right renal artery aneurysm, well over two centimeters in a hypertensive, and that'll either have to be embolized or resected. So again, the other thing in terms of this case, for an example, is the fact multi-organs, multiple vessels, are all analyzed in a single examination. And in many patients, there are multiple areas of involvement. Now we are seeing more patients with known or suspected FMD, fibromuscular dysplasia in our practice. You can see on the upper image very nicely the beating of the right renal artery and the volume rendering. And on the second case, also beating of a good portion of the right renal artery, very nicely shown there as well. Fibromuscular dysplasia can be bilateral, it can be unilateral, it can be segmental, or it can involve the entire vessel. Now, another patient, this patient had FUO and hematuria. When you look carefully at the kidneys on the MIP imaging and on the cinematic imaging, what you see are multiple small pseudoaneurysms in the patient's renal arteries and its branches, but you also see these multiple aneurysms in the splenic arteries, intrasplenic, as well as in the patient's branches of the SMA. So in this case, we could diagnose a vasculitis, which was polyaritis nodosa, having aneurysms and some pseudoaneurysms in multiple vessels from the splenic artery to the SMA, to the IMA, to the renal arteries, very nicely shown. Now, just some basic uh, 
important points. How do you get a great study? It's all protocol. Bolus triggering or fixed delay. Typically, bolus triggering works better if you're doing the abdomen. When you hit a trigger, let's say, on a 64 or more scanner of about 200 at the level of the diaphragm, you can start scanning. Fixed delays work fairly well also, unless patients are older and have poor cardiac output. But arterial phase imaging at about 30 to 35 seconds, if you're injecting 100 to 120 cc's, at 5 cc's a second of something like Omni 350 or Visi 320 works very nicely. We don't use test bolus techniques in these examples. And you can see when you time things correctly, the aorta is measuring 500 Hounsfield units. And when you look at the sagittal view, you can see that the SMA and celiac are well opacified, as is the aorta but they're all basically at the same density. So you don't have flow-related artifacts where is there a thrombus in the vessel? Is there a dissection? All sorts of questions you may come up with. None of those questions you have here. Now in terms of protocol, 64 slice or better, you want sub-centimeter sections. We use 0.75 millimeters every 0.5 and that works out very nicely. As I mentioned, axials is only the start of the study multiplanar, especially coronal imaging, and 3D rendering, a combination of volume rendering and MIP. The volume rendering could be classic volume rendering or cinematic, and the MIP is classic MIP. So let's look at some examples. This patient with Crohn's disease, I showed you a couple other cases with Crohn's. Very nicely, abdominal pain. You can see the thickening of the small bowel, distally, the mucosal enhancement. But then when you go to the coronal view, which is a bit better at showing the length of involvement. You also see the prominent vas erecta, but that's even better shown when you go to the MIP imaging, and you can see the comb sign, or you go to the volume rendering, which not only shows you the vessels and the impressive vessel mapping of the patient's active disease, but also shows you the thickening of the small bowel, active Crohn's disease. We also talk about things with vessels in the GI tract like SMA syndrome. There the vessel is not narrowed, but the angle of the vessel to the aorta is decreased. C classically described with um, patients who were put in whole body casts, we now see it in patients with marked weight loss and in patients with anorexia nervosa. The thing is to me, the angle of the SMA may be decreased, but it doesn't mean you have SMA syndrome. When you have SMA syndrome, you also have dilated duodenum. So classic numbers, SMA syndrome angle typically under 10 degrees, and the distance SMA to aorta is under 10 millimeters. Here's a good example of a patient who was thought to have gastric outlet obstruction, and the stomach indeed is distended, but as you follow it down, it's not just the stomach, it's the duodenum. And if you follow this down, you see the duodenum gets dilated and then narrowed right where it crosses beneath the SMA. Here it is on the coronal view, very nicely shown, a wonderful example of SMA syndrome. And if you take that same case and you look at the sagittal views, look at the angle of the SMA to the aorta. There's barely any angle. Remember the two things between the SMA and the aorta besides the patient's duodenum, is also the left renal vein. So you get compression of the left renal vein and so-called nutcracker syndrome. And here's just another example, dilated duodenum. And here you very nicely see the SMA cutting off the duodenum, that's SMA syndrome. And again, the sagittal view decreasing the angle. I'm always careful if I don't see duodenal obstruction or dilatation to call SMA syndrome, because many patients, particularly skinnier patients, or cancer patients who have lost weight often have decreased SMA to aorta angle, but most of those patients don't have symptoms. So you want to be very careful what you call. And here's just a few more images of a nice case of SMA uh, narrowing of the angle and SMA syndrome. Another example here, abdominal pain. Look at the duodenum, it's dilated. Transition over right by the SMA. And you can see where the SMA is compressing the duodenum on these MIP images. And then very nicely on the sagittal view, you see the markedly decreased angle between the SMA and the aorta. All the features I need to see to make the diagnosis of SMA syndrome. And here it is with volume rendering, nicely showing you the duodenum and the cutoff right here 
by the SMA. Very nicely shown. And then the sagittal views to match it. And you can see very nicely the cinematic rendering is really excellent for looking at these cases. Now, when you look at the mesenteric vessels, I usually don't measure things. I look at symmetry. Now, it's interesting. We often see small vessels in patients who are hypotensive. You can get large vessels in aneurysms, but usually it's obvious. But if you had to mention what size is, celiac trunk 0.8 centimeters, common hepatic artery 0.5, proper hepatic artery a bit under 0.5, and splenic artery also 0.5 or a little bit less. So they're all about the same. Now, when we look at vessels, it's a very important component when we're looking for intestinal ischemia. Whether it's arterial disease or venous disease, more common we're looking at arterial disease, but again, you'll be looking carefully at the venous structures as well, portal vein and SMV. The most of the time we have problems is typically going to be looking at arterial structures, and whether it's due to vessel narrowing, due to atherosclerosis, or even occlusion from atherosclerosis, or occlusion more commonly from embolic phenomena, or even trauma are things we can look at. Now, when you think about ischemic bowel, we do have findings that relate to the bowel. Is the bowel dilated? Is the wall thickened over three millimeters? What about dilated veins? What about edema in the mesenteric fat? When things are more progressive, you might see air in the bowel wall, pneumatosis, or air in the portal venous system. But the thing you want to really look carefully at is going to be the arterial structures. Sometimes the vessels are patent, but they're small in caliber. Then I'm suggesting the patient has a low flow state. Sometimes you'll see the vessel occluded. Sometimes you'll only see a thrombus. Now, intestinal ischemia has a high morbidity mortality unless you diagnose it early. In this article by Paulson, ischemia is the complication that increases the morbidity mortality associated with small bowel obstruction, specifically the mortality rate in patients who undergo surgery for SBO with ischemic bowel is as high as 25% compared with those without strangulation where it's as low as 2%. So a very important finding. Again, um, conservative management uh, occasionally is okay in certain different applications, spontaneous dissection of the splenic artery. But when you have bowel infarction, you really need to do CT. And if CT has a finding, you need to go to the OR. Patients who are not aggressively managed have, in general, a very poor outcome. Now, in this article by Paulson, again, he makes the point, the CT findings associated with ischemic bowel include bowel wall thickening, mesenteric edema or fluid in the adjacent mesentery or peritoneal space, abnormal decreased bowel wall enhancement, and pneumatosis with or without associated gas in the mesenteric or portal veins. Now, the one thing he doesn't mention is looking at the vessels. Now, he does describe that in the article. So what do we look at? Normally, I always look at sagittal views to look at the aorta and the mesenteric vessels. And sometimes you'll see plaque, not uncommon in older patients, particularly near the takeoff of the vessels. And I'll comment on that I see calcification. Sometimes I'll mention narrowing if it's there. Here's a good example of the vessel being patent, but multiple calcified and non-calcified plaques in the SMA and calcified plaque by the origin of the celiac. And here's just a few more images and more inferiorly, you see the large abdominal aortic aneurysm with moderate thrombus present. But this case with abdominal pain is different. It's not the plaque. There is some plaque here, but look at the SMA. There's no flow. There's a big thrombus in the SMA. And you can see it beautifully on the sagittal view. The patient in this case is not atherosclerotic disease because it's not this gradual narrowing. It's occlusion going into literally the aorta. That's typically due to a thrombus or thromboembolic event. And you can see as you get further down in the vessel, there is flow present. But this thrombus will need to be removed or the patient could develop ischemic and infarcted bowel. Now, remember I showed you this case before where everything looks good. Celiac, SMA, aorta, IMA look good, but there's an embolic phenomenon. There's a thrombus right here in the SMA. Here it is on the 3D where the vessel is cut off. Again, the importance of looking distally at the vessel. We always look proximally because we expect to see atherosclerotic disease, but you want to look distally because that may be where the thrombus is. And again, MIP can be very helpful in that regard.
And here as I rotate the MIP images, you really can see the critical location of a significant thrombus, which was eventually removed and the patient did recover. Now, a point I make, and I've seen this with a few malpractice cases uh, for the state of Maryland, is that if you're looking at this case and the question is abdominal pain related ischemic bowel or just abdominal pain, when you look at this case, you say, aha, there's the aorta, not bad. There's the SMA, not bad. I'm not worried. But when you get further down the SMA, this was missed. Now, I have to admit it's further down and perhaps it's just flow related and perhaps you don't recognize it. There's no bowel wall thickening. There's no mesenteric inflammation. You're really not concerned. But if you would get the sagittal views, look at the SMA and there's the clot. The sagittal views were never gotten in this case. You always need to look at sagittal views because often things aren't that impressive on the axial. It's easy to walk by things. But the sagittal view, like in this case, makes the thrombus all too obvious and very nicely shown. Now, to emphasize the point, you can't assume that because you don't see a thrombus, that a thrombus is not present unless you've seen the entire vessel. In most cases, you will probably be correct, but when you're wrong, you're going to have a problem. So you want to look very carefully at the vessel, and I think on the sagittal view, it makes it much easier to do than simply looking at axial images. Another example, this patient, the study looks like a non-contrast scan. The bowel is dilated. It's not really enhancing well. Maybe there's some air in the bowel wall. But look at the sagittal view. Celiac looks good, but there's the SMA occluded. There's the IMA. This was occlusion of the SMA. They went in. They removed the thrombus. There's the patient a week later. They got in early enough that the patient's bowel, which was not pink at the time, they were concerned for ischemia, they removed the thrombus, the bowel looked good, they were able to close. So a nice example of showing you, again, how you can have thrombus, even extensive thrombus, but no underlying atherosclerotic disease and how easy things are to miss and how easy things are to make the right diagnosis. Here's another case, abdominal pain. You see the changes in the small bowel. Inflammation, ischemia is one of the possibilities. Sagittal view, there's the SMA looking great until you find this big thrombus. So a very, very easy diagnosis to make. On the volume rendering, there's the vessel cut off. Here you can see it reconstitutes distally, but just a real nice example of vascular occlusion, which could lead to ischemia. Again, look at the entire vessel, scroll down, but I think what's most helpful is really looking at those sagittal views. Now I have some other things related to the SMA, but I think what I'll do is why don't we stop right here, let's get a cup of coffee, and then we'll pick it up at some other SMA pathologies that are important to all of us. And I'll be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.